السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله واحدا ورب شاهدا ونحن له مسلمون وأشهد أن سيدنا وشفيعنا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا ونور قلوبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسل الله تعالى بالحق مشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته وأهل بيته وطاعته وأولياء ملته وعلماء شريعته وشهداء محبته أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ثم أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا ونساء كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذين تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا وقال عز وجل في مقام الأخر يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اتقوا الله حيث ما كنت وقال عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم النكاح من سنتي وقال أيضا فمن رغب عن سنتي فليس مني أو كما قال عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآياته وذكر الحكيم إنه تعالى جواد كريم ملك بر رؤوف الرحيم أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين إنه هو الغفور الرحيم In the Quran al-Kareem and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a man and a woman coming together and being partners to one another We know from the Quran al-Kareem and from the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala befitting to his majesty Jalla Jalalahu how his speech is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes something or someone then that is the best of descriptions when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the relationship of a man and a woman he subhanahu wa ta'ala says hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lakum they are your garments and you are their garments. This is a relationship of a man and a woman after they have come together, after the aqad has taken place, the nikah has taken place, the Islamic marriage has taken place. Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna libas. One of the supplications of the Prophet was, which can be found in the collection by Imam al-Nabawi, al-Athkar al-Nabawi sharif Allahumma albisni libas taqwa minka Oh Allah, adorn us with garments that are full of God consciousness that are full of taqwa minka of you that we are always aware of you Albisni libas taqwa minka Make us amongst those people who are always aware of you subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Quran al kareem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about a man and a woman, Hunna libasul lakum wa antu libasul lahunna. Straight away we get a clear indication that the way you are with one another and the way you are when you are away from one another as a husband and a wife, 
you should be always in a state of awareness of Allah. For whatever you do and say as a man will be a reflection of your wife. And as a wife, what you do and say will be a reflection of your husband. You wear your garments and when you are away from your husband or your wife, your garments still stay with you. So it is an informal representation of your partner. How are you as an individual when you are with your wife, when you are with your husband, and how are you when you are away from one another, says everything about you. As your garment, your libas, says everything about you. The way you carry yourself, the garments that you wear, says everything about you. For instance, garments that are worn by individuals which cover them appropriately shows that they have haya, awareness, have some sort of shame, modesty, humility. For the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu has said, Iman and shame are together. When one is gone, the other one does not stay. Faith and shame are together. When one is gone, the other does not stay. And he has also said the narration which can be found in the collection by Imam al-Muslim in the Sahih, that if a believer has shame, then they have everything. And if a believer does not have shame, then let them be as they are, they have nothing. Haya, shame. What is shame? What is haya? One of the greatest things about the Ummah of Rasulullah a trait that seems to be disappearing, a sign that seems to be disappearing. One of the signs of the believers was what? Shame, haya. For instance, if you look at the prophetic lifestyle, if you look through Sirat al-Nabawi Sharif, you will see the narration that can be found in Sirat Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, and so on and so forth, and the Sirat compiled by Ibn Kathir, that one of the greatest things of the Sahaba, the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Ansar wa Al-Muhajir, the helpers and the people who migrated, was that they were always foremost in shame, in haya. And one of the greatest traits of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Abi Affan anhu the son-in-law of the Messenger of Allah alayhi, after he had married the princess of the household of the Prophet alayhi, once the Messenger of Allah alayhi, walked in into the Hujrat al-Sharif into the room where he is resting now and he walked in and he sat down and that day, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Abi Affan radiyallahu anhu arda had come to visit him with Sayyida Ruqayya radiyallahu anha. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked towards them and he smiled. Then he looked away and he smiled. And he looked towards them again and he smiled. And then he looked away and he smiled. And the other companions who were with him and the Azwaj Mutaharat, the mothers of the believers who were there, he said to them, Sayyidah Umm Salma radiallahu anha, she narrates this, have you seen anyone more beautiful than Uthman? And they said, no one is more beautiful than Uthman. Look how beautiful he looks. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he looks beautiful because he is sitting with his wife and she is also beautiful. So the way they were with one another, that was beauty. You understand? It's not always about having a facial and having the eyebrow plucked and having the blackhead come out your nose. It's not always about that. It's about what's inside and it shines on the outside. That is true beauty. And that ain't an excuse for mingles. I've heard people say, no, no, when you say beauty, it comes from the inside, that's an excuse for ugly people. <laughs> no, it ain't. Someone may be ugly to you, but beautiful to someone else. There is no such thing as ugly. It's how you see one another. It's within yourself. Something or someone may be attractive to you, but completely unattractive to something or someone else. It's about how you are on the inside. It's how you are with one another. That is true beauty. Look at Sayyidina Bilal al-Habshi radiyallahu anhu arda, the first caller, Mu'addin. We all know he comes from a Habshi background. He was black. You understand? And it was a known thing amongst the Arabian Peninsula at that time that people from the Ahbash from Africa were looked down upon. 
But the day came and Jibreel alayhi salam came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his slave Bilal radiallahu anhu arda. The beauty on his face is mesmerizing. Oh. Why? Because of what was inside. Inner character. The way you are as an individual, that is true beauty. So the way Sayyidina Uthman ibn Abi Affan radiallahu anhu arda was with Sayyidina Ruqayya radiallahu anha. That was true beauty, true companionship. How do we as Muslims take examples from the life of Rasulullah and the lives of the companions about marriage and love? Let us try to understand one thing first. You know when we as Muslims, when we say that love comes after marriage, love comes after marriage, many a time people find that hard to understand and comprehend that how can you fall in love after you are married? Surely love must come first and then you decide to marry. Number one, true love is that which is pleasing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in line with the prophetic tradition. That is true love. Love should not take you out of the boundaries of the deen. It should not make you earn the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way whatsoever. That cannot be love. For love is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. So if a blessing takes you away from the pleasure of Allah, it is not a blessing. So love is a blessing. After nikah, after the aqad has taken place, the ijab and qabul, do you accept? Yeah, accept, you accept, yeah, you have accepted. Okay, the marriage happens. Thereafter, the time that you spend with one another, you get to know each other better. You get to know each other's habits. You become aware of one another. Straight away, as a man, we have been given clear instructions by the Messenger of Allah Salawat alayhi. Number one, realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a partner, not a servant. Allah has given you a partner. And in the Quran al karim at the beginning of Surah An-Nisa, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhun nasu'budu rabbukum alladhi khallaqakum min nafsun Oh mankind, worship your Lord. He is that Lord who created you. From one life. Then from that one life, he created the partner. Sayyidina Adam ala nabiyyina wa alayhi salatu wassalam was created. And then from the rib of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained it for Sayyida Hawa to be created. Lahu kun fayakun. And she came about. From the rib, the rib lies under the arm. You know when we want to protect something, we put it under our, our arm. Your wife is your partner. She is supposed to be under your protection. You give your own life over hers. As a man, this is instruction for you. From the Messenger of Allah, Salawat Rabbi wa Salamun Alayh, your wives are your partners, not your servants or your slaves. Number two, as a man, we have been told the narrations which can be found in the collection of, uh, of Imam al Muslim and al Bayhaqi and the collection of the Sunan of Imam al Tirmidhi. But Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu arda, in which he says, I heard the Messenger of Allah, Salawat Rabbi wa Salamun Alayh, said, in which means, if your wife does one thing to displease you, one thing, you will have to find ten good things in her to replace that one thing. So find ten good things in your wife that she one thing displeases me, ten good things please me about her. As a man. We have been told as a man that you are a partner to your wife. Look at the prophetic example of a partner. The brother who was doing the nasheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, increase you for your love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make you become an obedient servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The words that he was saying when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came down from the mount, narrated by Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu in the Sahih of Imam al-Muslim, that he came running down from the mountain on that particular day. It was the month of Ramadan, the hottest month. And he came running into the house and he said to Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha, cover me, cover me, envelope me, envelope me, 
cover me, cover me. Zambiluni. Why? For I have seen something that I cannot comprehend. She then sat him down. She consoled him. She spoke to him. He found comfort in her words. She was his best friend. He could speak to her about anything and everything. He was totally open with her. There was no restrictions between him and her. There was no ego and pride and arrogance between him and his wife. If anything, they spoke to him so openly. Later on, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find in Madinah al Munawwara, Sayyidah Umm Salma radiallahu anha, she narrates, which can be found in the collection of Imam al-Tirmidhi, that once I walked in to the house of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sitting next to the mother of the believer, Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha, and Sayyidah Aisha pushed him across the chest. She pushed him, and I said, Ya Aisha, you push the Messenger of Allah? You're pushing the Messenger? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked towards Umm Salma and he said, Ya Umm Salma, today she's pushing me. Sometimes, sometimes she does things that are worse than this. Sometimes she does more. He smiled. He smiled. He didn't become vexed up. You understand? He might have become vexed for no reason. You're pushing me? Do you know me? Do you know who I am? Mm -mm. There was no arrogance, there was no pride. This is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi rahmatun lil alameen. Mercy in every situation. Mercy. And he said, she pushes me today, sometimes she does worse things. Look at the incident, how he was with Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu anha. When once Sayyidah Abu Bakr radiallahu anha walked into the house. And he came towards Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu anha. The father came towards the daughter. And he came with his hand lifted. He came with his hand lifted. And he said, and you read the narration, the narration is that he used the word insolent towards his daughter. You insolent woman. You raise your voice in front of the messenger? You raise your voice in front of him? And what did she do? She ran behind the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she looked towards the right and said, Abu Bakr came towards the right. So she went towards the left. So he came towards the left. And she kept going round. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eventually held his hands out and he said, okay, okay, calm down. Ya Abu Bakr, calm down, calm down. And he said, Messenger of Allah, why do you let her speak to you like this? Why do you do this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, what? She is my wife and I am her husband. She is my wife and I am her husband. It's not I am her owner and she is my property. She can't chat back to me, you understand? Mm -mm. There was what? There was healthy conversation between them. They could relate to one another. Adab was always upheld. Adab was always upheld. Adab in reality is what? What is Adab? Adab. The whole deen is Adab. What is Adab? Adab is respecting one another's differences. Adab is respecting one another's rights. Adab is recognizing one another as a human who has needs that are fulfilling and being in line with a prophetic character. Hada adab. Deenu kulluhu adabun. The whole deen is adab. When Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu anha, when she recognized the differences between herself and the other mothers of the believers, you know, sometimes there was healthy jealousy there. Healthy jealousy, I call it. For once when one of the wives of the believers, she sent some honey to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu anha, she took it and she said, okay, I'll pass it on to him. I'll pass it on to him. And then she didn't give it to him. And she bought another dish instead and said, Messenger, look what I've bought for you. Look what I've bought for you. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then ate the food. The other mother of the believer, she came in later on in the evening and she's Messenger of Allah, did you like the honey? And he said, what honey? And she looked at Aisha Siddiqah and said, Aisha said, well, I forgot to give it to him, innit? I must have left it somewhere, I forgot to give it to him. This was healthy competition between them to earn the love of the Messenger of Allah Salawat Rabbi Wasallam Alayhi Wa Alayhi But he Sallallahu Alayhi Wa Alayhi Wa Sallam at that point, what did he do? He smiled at Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqah Radiallahu Anha. He smiled at her. And he said, Ya Binti Abu Bakr, O daughter of Abu Bakr, you, you certainly have your ways. You certainly have your ways. Look at the time when Rasulullah Salawat Rabbi Wasallam Alayhi used to race 
have racing competitions with Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. I believe I've mentioned this here before, but could you imagine your mom and dad running down the road, <laughs> having a race in Sheffield? A bit difficult to imagine, do you know what I mean? But the message of Allah salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi, he would go racing with Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. And sometimes he would slow down, so she exceeds him. He would slow down, so she exceeds him, so she doesn't feel as if she's lost out because he never wanted to make her feel bad. He salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi was and is the best of examples for us. The best of creation, the best of examples. Awwalul awwalin wal akhirul akhirin. Salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi wa ala alayhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created and will not create anyone as perfect as Him in every sense of the word. In His character, in His beauty, in His living and in His passing. For His salawat Rabbi wa salam alayhi has said, my living is good for you, my passing is good for you. So look at His whole example, the best in every situation as a warrior, as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband as a son, as a partner, as a friend, as a political leader, as a leader of the Ummah, as a Nabi, a Prophet, as a Rasul, as a Messenger, as Sayyid al-Ulul Uthbat al-Rasul salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi wa ala alayhi. The leader and the master of all of the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. Tilka al-Rasul fadlna ba'dhum wa la'bad. Minhum man kallam allahu wa rafa' ba'dhum darajat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his messengers and amongst them he has created ranks where some of them used to speak to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and others had higher ranks than even that. So he salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi is perfect in every sense of the word. But look at the way he is in his household with his wives. Look at the way he is with his companions and how he gives them the instruction to treat their wives. Sayyidina Umar ibn Abi Khattab narrates, and Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah narrates, the narrations which can be found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim and the collection of Imam Bayhaqi. Once a woman came to the Messenger of Allah salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi wa ala alayhi, and she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm extremely vexed. I'm angry. The Messenger of Allah salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi said, La taghdab, do not get angry. And she said, How can I not get angry? My husband does not fulfill his rights towards me and the rights that I have over him. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what rights do you speak of? Does he not feed you? She said, yes, I am fed. Do you not have clothing? Yes, I have clothing. Do you not have shelter? Yes, I have shelter. Do you not have companionship? She said, no, he does not fulfill the rights of companionship towards me. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, how long has it been? She said it has been three months. And this is a narration which can be found in the Hadith Kitab. And we take clear lessons from these and we have to speak about them openly. If you're going to take instructions from the prophetic life. She said three months have passed. The Messenger of Allah Salawat Rabbi wa Salam alayhi said, go and call your husband. The husband was called. The Messenger of Allah Salawat Rabbi wa Salam alayhi asked, are you not pleased with your wife? He said, of course I'm pleased. Do you not find her attractive? Of course I find her attractive. Do you not want to be with her? Of course I want to be with her. Why do you not fulfill your rights? Do you have an illness? He said, Alhamdulillah ala ni'mah. Allah be praised in this blessing. I am physically and fine. Do you have a mental illness? He said, no. Physical illness, no. What is the reason? I work long hours and I get tired. I work long hours and I get tired. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said what? Shorten your hours of work and increase time with your wife for that is the right Allah has given her. Shorten your hours of work and spend more time with your wife. For that is the right Allah has given her. She came back a month later and she said, Messenger of Allah, salawat rabbi salam alayhi, there's no woman happier than me in Medina. <laughs> Rasulullah salawat rabbi salam alayhi, what? Giving instructions of how to fulfill your rights towards one another. Sayyidina Nabi alayhi afdalu salatu wa ta'amu taslim was once approached by a woman who was so vexed and angered that her hijab was away from her head and on her shoulders. The Messenger of Allah Salawat Rabbi Wasallam Alayhi looked away and he said, please cover yourself appropriately. She said, oh Messenger of Allah, please pardon me. I'm so angry and overtaken by this turmoil. She used the word turmoil. Malahim in my life that I can't think of anything else. He said, may Allah grant you ease. What is this turmoil in your life? 
She said, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, my husband always chooses other people over me. He always chooses others over me, where I am supposed to be his priority. I am his wife, I am his partner. Why is it that he always chooses others over me? Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, give me an example. She said, if I ask for something that is needed in the household, he says, wait, and I'll wait up to three days, up to three days. And if someone else asks for something, it won't even be three hours and their needs are fulfilled. And I have to wait up to three days and this keeps on happening. And I've said to him that, look, I need certain things in the house. If you do not go and get them, I will go and get them myself. But he says, no, I will get them, but I still have to wait up to three days. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi said, call your husband. The husband was called. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi asked him, why is it that your wife has to go through this? Why? What is the reason? She is your partner, you are her partner. You have made a pact with her, you have a contract. The moment you said, an nikatuha wa qabiltuha wa tazawwajtuha. In Urdu you would say, mene kabul kiya. In English, yes, I have accepted. Kabul kiya, kabul. You know that there's a reason the Imam asked you three times, you know, because he's deaf. <laughs> no, no. The one brother says to me, one brother says, I think the Imam done my nikah was deaf. So I said, so what? So what if he's deaf? Your nikah's done, isn't it? Because yeah, he asked me three times. Kabul me kabul hai, kabul kabul hai, kabul hai, three times. Saying it once fulfills the right. You see, saying it once, the moment you say kabul hai, kabul to her, I've accepted her, and she says I've accepted him, the nikah is finalized, okay? It's sunnah to ask twice, recommended to ask three times, but you do not have to ask three times. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded him, the moment you said I have accepted and she accepted you, your nikah was done, she has rights. Why do you not fulfill them? He says, oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, I have, I have a large family. You know, I have a large family. I have a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins and nephews. I'm sure it must have been Pakistani. <laughs> it must have been. No, no, it wasn't. He said, I have a large family. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, she is your family. She is your family. From her, Allah will bring about your progeny. She is number one to you now. You understand? She is number one to you. So these are instructions for brothers when you get married, inshallah. Sisters, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi has given us clear instructions. What does it mean to be a wife to a husband? As I mentioned previously, it should not be the false understanding that you are servants to your husband, or you are slaves to your husband, love Allah. In reality, you are partners to them. Being a partner means that you understand one another. You console one another. You stand by one another. You, as a wife to a husband, should come into the frame of understanding eventually that just by looking at him, you know what he's going through. And a husband, the same with the wife. You just look at her and you know what she's going through. The emotions that they are going through, that what you go through, you look at one another and you understand. He's having a bad day today. He's not too well today. Something's burdening him. Something's worrying him. You've just got to look at your husband and you know this. How do you know this? How do you get to understand this? This is what you call muhabba. This is love. This is what true love is. True love is not only having that physical attraction. True love is understanding that individual just by looking at them. Or being away from them and understanding, you know what, this is what they're going to be wanting right now. This is what they need right now, or this is what their habit is right now. Being aware of one another to the extent. Let me give you a clear example. No example can be than your own, better than your own. I'll give you my example. Since I've been married, alhamdulillah, ala ni'mah, there's not been a single day when I'm at home, that I get up for Salat al-Fajr and my wife is not awake with me. Wallah, alhamdulillah ala hadha ni'mah. And there's not been a single day without me asking her to. Soon as Salat al-Fajr is over, my wife knows that this is my time for my awrad and wazayat, the recitation, whatever, and she'll turn up with a cup of tea. And that's the best thing in the morning. A fat cup of tea. That's what you need. Especially in a cold morning like this, you need a Fat cup of tea. <laughs> but she just turns up with it. 
Wallah, I've never asked her to. Where's my tea? Or make me tea? No. I asked her one day, why do you make me tea every morning? She said, it's your habit. I said, how did you know it was my habit? She said, well, when we first got married, I saw that you'd get up in the morning and I was praying Fajr one time and you'd already finished your Fajr and you came upstairs with two cups of tea, one for yourself, one for me. So I thought, let me do it for you now. Without me asking her to, without me telling her to. She received good instruction from her mom and dad, you understand? Her mom and dad both were like, Bleh! But she just knew this without me asking her to, without me telling her to. I know my wife's habit that on certain days of the week, for example, on Fridays, she needs her time at the time of Salat al Jum'ah. That's her time. You don't disturb her. She'll ignore you. You man could be dying. She won't care. <laughs> That's her prayer time. Remember, that's her time with Allah. She don't care who you are, where you are, what you are. Not her. It's my time with Allah. So I know that time of Salat al Jum'ah, when she'll do her Surah al Kahaf, she'll pray her Salat al Dhuhr, and then she'll sit there reciting her Salawat, and she'll recite her Dalal al Khairat, and what have you. So I know that in, in our room, where the books, where the kitabs are on the high shelf, that she's a bit short, you understand, so she can't reach them. So I know that I'll just pick them up and put them on the bottom shelf for her. It's Friday, she'll need this. But this is just something that I picked up by observing her throughout the years of marriage. She's never asked me to do this, it's just something that I want to do for her. But you know, these small, small things, they have big impacts. Small, 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 pebbles, 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 eventually turn into stones, stones eventually turn into mountains. Small things you do for one another, having a good understanding of one another. What is marriage itself? What is a wedding in Islam? Now, this is a very, very, I won't say controversial, but a very colorful subject when it comes to Asian Muslims. Because you have a wedding in Islam, then you have a wedding in Pakistan. <laughs> you have a wedding in Islam, and you have a wedding in Africa, where you come from. You have a wedding in Islam, you have a wedding in India. You have a wedding in Islam and a wedding everywhere else. A wedding in Islam is what? You know, we have to respect people's cultures. We have to respect people's traditions. We cannot be that community which says it's only this, that's it, and not that. Look at Islam today. Seriously, look around the globe. You won't find one group of Muslims that have a wedding that is exactly the same to another group of Muslims. And if you do, you're looking at the same group. <laughs> look at the different groups. For example, when you come to Africa, where we come from, and you look at a wedding happening in Africa, a typical wedding would be on a Friday night after Salat al-Isha, the nikah would happen, okay? The groom will come into the masjid, and the qadi, the khalif, would ask, do you take so-and-so's daughter who's been representative by, represented by her wakil, the representative, and these people are the witness, do you accept her? And you say, I accept her. Okay? Khalas. That's it. You'll be wearing your thawb and your amama, and then you, they, people would stand and come and greet you, and as you walk out of the masjid, then there'd be little children standing there with big bowls of dates and almonds. Okay? That's the wedding done. Then the following day after Salat al Dhuhr, there'll be the Walima. The Walima. Okay? Sisters would be congregated with the bride in a separate venue. And soon as the nikah is done, it would be announced in there, the groom has accepted. And then sisters, they do their thing. In Africa, they have a tradition where the women pick up the doves and they start playing the doves. And then they sing songs, wedding songs in Arabic and Kiswahili and so on and so forth. That is a wedding celebration in Africa. The following day is the Walima. Okay? The day after the bride and groom, the new couple, they go and visit all of their families, all of their cousins and relatives. They get invited, what we say, for um, sweet milk. They have some milk and they put some sugar in it and some almonds and what have you. And then they make you drink it and you better drink it because if you don't drink it, your auntie is going to bang you out one time. <laughs> one time. But it's a bit grimy. It's a bit grimy because it. Ew. You drink that milk and you say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, beautiful milk, JazakAllah, move on to the next milk, move on to the next milk, move on to the next milk. There's bare milk to drink. But that's an African wedding, you understand? I've been to many Pakistani weddings. You have food for one day, and then you have food another day. 
and then you have food under the bed. <laughs> and by the time you're sick of eating, oh, now's the nikah. <laughs> and nobody's invited to that only close family, and it happens in the front room somewhere. <laughs> Aji. But this is supposed to be the most important thing. You understand? The nikah should be the thing that's done in public, that the groom accepts, the bride accepts in private, and then the wakil and so on and so they come, and this is supposed to be the public thing, the nikah, the aqab, the ijab al qabul, and then the walima the following day. But there's different traditions that happen. You have the hina, you know, the mendi stuff happening, and then you have the spell thing happening, but they spill oil on your head for no apparent reason. <laughs> All of these different things happening. But you go to a Malaysian wedding. I've been to a wedding in Malaysia. And with the groom and the bride, there'll be separate venues, but simultaneously, whatever's happening in the groom's room is happening in the bride's room. You understand? If the bride stands, the groom will talk, stand, stand, she's standing in there. All right. <laughs> but this is their tradition. And they sit down, because they sit down now. But this is their tradition. And then the nikah would happen, and then they would have dots playing. They play the dots, the one-sided drums, and they probably sing Tala al-Badru alayna or something. You understand? The following day after Salatul Dhuhr would be the walima. You go to the Zulu areas where we come from in Africa, but there's Muslims living there. And their, tradi their wedding traditions are bare rago. Trust me. That's some rago stuff going on. But they have the nikah and they have the walima and many other traditions happening as well. My point being, today in Islam, we have to appreciate and understand different cultures. For our culture and tradition makes us what we are. As long as the practice does not contradict Sharia. As long as that practice does not amount to shirk, it does not amount to kufr. This is a celebration of a lifestyle and Islam permits it. For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remember at the time of the wedding of Sayyidah Khadija al-Kubra radiyallahu anha and himself, when they got married, what happened? And this was before the declaration of prophecy. What happened? That tradition was carried on after the declaration of prophecy. It carried on afterwards as well, where a brief speech was given, a khutbah was given, reminders were given from the Quran al karim The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were some weddings that he conducted were extremely simple. Extremely simple, and remember, simplicity is what Allah loves most. Simplicity is what Allah loves most. You know, if you are having a wedding, and if you have to take out a loan for it, la asraf, inna Allah la yuhibbul musrifin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those people who go into asraf wastage. Rather, whatever you can afford. You know this whole competition thing? Mataya's daughter, when she got married, they had bare cars. We got have bare cars. <laughs> Falsehood, batil. You know, when you, get, when you get, get into this understanding, yeah, yeah, you know one of my boys who got married, yeah? He was wearing red and white flowers. I'm going to wear pink, red and white flowers. <laughs> one more flower. Asraf. Go buy whatever you can afford. If you can afford it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless it. If you can't afford a Bentley, go for it. What's wrong with it? Allah has given you that money, that ni'mah, that blessing. But if you can't afford the Bentley, don't step out of your turf. You understand? Don't step out of your turf and get yourself into trouble by taking out a loan and borrowing money just so you can be seen with a Bentley on your wedding day. That's falsehood. That's asraf. There's no need for that. There were some writings that were conducted by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated by Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu we went to a nikah, the aqad, that was conducted by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood and he said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu taqullah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon O you who believe fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ittaqullah as it is his right that he be feared, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do not die except that you are a Muslim. And then he said, and nikah min sunnati. Nikah is from my traditions. And then again he said, فَمَنْ رَغِيبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِ فَلَيْسَ minni. Whoever shuns my tradition is not from my community. And then he sat and he said to the father of the bride, are you so-and-so the son of so-and-so? He said, naam, I am. 
Do you take permission from your daughter? He said, yes, I have already taken a permission. Are you someone, someone witness to it? Are you a witness to it? They said, yes, we are. He took the hand of the father. He put it into the hand of the groom. He put his own hand on top and he asked, do you, so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, take on so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so, who is being representative, represented by so-and-so, into your nikah? He says, Abiltuha, I have accepted her. And then he said, do you give her the mehar, the dowry? Why was the dowry here mentioned? Remember, dowry is that amount which is given to the bride. For Allah forbid, if you are to die an early death, and if it's Allah's will, then it will happen, then she's able to sustain herself for four months and 10 days. For the time of idda, it is not something that is supposed to be specified that we want 10,000 pounds, or we want 15,000 tola of gold, and 68 billion diamonds, <laughs> and a motorbike. <laughs> that's that's stupidness. The dowry, is something that is agreed between the bride and the groom. The bride's father is spoken to that I am going to give this much, this amount, please ask her if it's sufficient. And if she says yes, it's sufficient, khalas. Okay, four months and 10 days, why? So if you're to get divorced or you die, then that is the amount that she's using to sustain herself, to look after herself, for she is in the period of waiting, of idda. Okay, it's not something that is extravagant or something that makes you go out of your way, or makes her go out of her way. We must also understand that the dowry in the times of the Prophet ﷺ, some of the companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be well pleased with them, they used to say that if I'm to marry so-and-so, I want him to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah by heart, that is my dowry. And some would say, I want him to become half of the Qur'an al kareem that is my dowry, that is enough. Others said, I want him to learn Surah Yasin by heart. That is enough for me. Whereas others said, I don't want any dowry. His dua, his supplication is enough for me, and my supplication is enough for him. And that is allowed. But the sort of mindset we are in today, seriously think. So you're getting married. Brother, are you married? No, inshallah. <laughs> Smile, bro. You know when you get married? Just for example, your wife to be turn around and say to you, listen, my diary is, you learn the whole Quran by heart, you don't stop there, every 13th, 14th, 15th of the month you fast, every month for the rest of your life, and I want you to take me to Umrah and Hajj. Inshallah you'll be able to do it, Inshallah Azza wa Jal. But the sort of mindset we are in today, would we truly be able to fulfill that diary? Seriously think, what have we become? What kind of community have we become as Muslims? We were supposed to be those people who when we were seen, think about the Muslims who went into China. Think about the Muslims who came into Africa. Not so long ago, Sayyidina Al-Habib Ahmad Mashur bin Taha Al-Haddad, 1994 he passed away. But when he came into East Africa, Wallah, I witnessed this myself. He came into the jungle area of Tanga in East Africa and he would be walking with his stick and time for Salah came, he put his stick down, took his ridha off his shoulder, put it on the floor, Allahu Akbar. He stood and he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he made sure that he was not disturbing anyone. He made sure he was not causing any inconvenience for anyone. It wasn't like, move out your way, I've got to pray, you understand? <laughs> like, he was abducting the prophetic character. People would look at him and they would come to him and sit with him. He could not even speak the language. He couldn't even speak Swahili. He was an Arab from Yemen. But he would communicate with them with facial gestures, with his hands. Those people started to take shahada from him. Today, those people established a madrasa where there's no less than 5,000 students learning on the east coast of Africa but how did that come about? The prophetic character. Think about the Muslims who went into China, the seven companions who went there. When two of them came back to Madinah to Munawwara and it was asked to them, what is the state of Muslims there? He said, Allah be praised. Without us even lifting our hands, they are coming towards Allah. Why is it? He said once it was time for Salatul Fajr, 
We were sitting inside a room, and we saw that if we start praying inside this room, it's going to cause inconvenience to the other people in the room. So we went outside. It was freezing. And we found a little corner, and we made wudu out of frozen water. We know that was snow. They say it was frozen water. We made wudu out of it. And we stood and we prayed. By the time we finished praying, there was men sitting around us. And these men were looking at our faces. And they said, who do you worship? They said, we worship Allah. We worship Allah. They started making justice to us. And they said, Allah, 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 subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through their character, men started coming towards Allah. Those men then would go back and narrate this to their wives. Those women started coming towards Allah. My respect to brothers and sisters in the deen. Today, the amount of Muslims we have in the world, they have never been before. Alhamdulillah. But the amount of dishonesty that we have amongst us, we have never been that dishonest before. The amount of disunity we have amongst us, we have never been this disunited before. The amount we are becoming more stretched towards the world, we have never become towards the world before. Do we not realize that this is the time the messenger spoke about salawat Where in the morning you will be living as a believer. Before nightfall, faith will be taken away from you. Your night will be spent in belief. Before morning, your faith will be taken away from you. What does this mean? It means you will not understand the importance of rectifying your character and standing by one another, supporting one another, being there for one another. That standing by one another, supporting one another, bring it closer to home. A husband and a wife, this is what you are supposed to be. Standing by one another, supporting one another. Never, ever, ever, as a believer, it is haram, forbidden for you to speak about what goes on behind closed doors with your wife. Today, wallah, I've heard with my own ears, brothers bragging about this sort of thing. La'natullah, Allah's curse be upon such a tongue, who brags about what he does with his wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them a better understanding of what you're supposed to be and what are you doing. Haya, shame has gone away from us. Akhlaq and adab, good character, seem to be going away from us. Respect for one another is vanishing from us. And then we are wondering why we are in a state of turmoil. How much longer are we going to turn around and blame others? How much longer? Seriously. Nobody's saying that the whole world is our best friend, but you ain't your best friend at the moment for sure. You definitely ain't your best friend at the moment. If you were true to yourself, would you not be that Muslim who before going to sleep at night would think, has my neighbor eaten today? Would you not think that, seriously? Would you not think that I'm traveling, okay? I'm traveling with someone. They may need something that I have. Give it to them instead of me. Putting someone else before you, if you were a true believer. If you were a true believer, would you not be concerned? As Rasulullah sallallahu said, لا يؤمن أحبكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. How come قال عليه الصلاة والتسليم? None can claim to believe unless they love for the Muslim brother or they love for themselves. Where is this in us? Seriously, where is this in us? Hubbun Nabi, love of the Messenger of Allah Salawat is to honor his teachings, not dishonor them. Hubbun Nabi, true love of the Messenger of Allah Salawat is to uphold his sunnah, not demolish it, not destroy it, not think bad of it and think good of yourself. Marriage is that foundation which should bring about true sunnah in your life. Marriage is the foundation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes pleased with. Do you know how? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when a married couple look towards one another with the eyes of love, without opening their mouths, without saying I love you, you just look towards one another and you smile. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gazes upon that couple with mercy. Gazes upon them. And then as a husband, you choose your wife's needs over yourself, Allah increases you in your Iman. As a wife, you choose your husband's needs over yourself, Allah increases you in Iman. But ayyuhli khotul muslimun wa ikhwat, be aware. 
this relationship is only sacred after nikah. After nikah. We cannot dishonor the teachings of the Prophet and pretend we are there for one another without doing nikah. Let's be open. Yeah? Girlfriend, boyfriend, relationship, haram relationship. There's nothing halal about it. You cannot be spending time with the girl mahram as the narration which can be found in the asnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and an nisai The Messenger of Allah sallallahu has said, let no man spend time in the company of that woman who is of no relation to him except that shaitan comes there. Except that shaitan comes there. You could be praying six salahs a day, my bro, let alone five. You could be praying your tahajjud, you could be fasting all day and staying awake all night, qiyamul layl, worshipping Allah. The moment you join yourself in that relationship, there's no blessings in your worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives an individual of blessings in their life if they go towards that path. Wala taqarab bis zina. La taqarab, do not even approach it, let alone do it. If you truly feel strongly for an individual, get married. Get married. And seriously, brothers and sisters, I totally understand. Just before we went to Hajj, there was, we had a seminar in Nottingham about marriage in Islam, a whole seminar. And one of the topics that we were discussing, when I say we, there was myself and three other Imams, was forced marriages. And brothers and sisters, who come from certain ethnic backgrounds whose wedding is arranged for them without their consent. And then they are forced to get married. Number one, we know this is not from Islam. Islam does not permit this. Wallah. And regardless of how you take it, you can take it with a bucket of salt or with anything you want. Islam does not permit forced marriages. Islam does not encourage you to get married to someone you don't even know. Islam does not allow someone else to make the decision for you. This is not Islam, this is not Sharia. And it is happening. This is something that's happening in our community as Muslims. It is happening, but this is a cultural clash with the deen. This is a cultural problem that is crept into the deen. And today we as Muslims, we are being blamed for something that has got nothing to do with the deen. And inshallah, I sincerely hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put any of you into that situation where you have to get forced married to someone you don't even know or your parents make the decision for you and do not even give you a choice in the matter. If you're strong enough to do it, bismillah, do it. But if you are sincere to yourself and to that individual, then you must stand for your right as a Muslim that I do not want to get married to someone who you have made a decision for on my behalf. When I was two years old and she was one years old, you got me engaged. <laughs> it happens. It happens. And this is something that is so common. As a result, there's a lot of negativity and a lot of negation coming from it. Especially in the north of England, we've all been reading about it in the newspapers, we've all been seeing it in the news. I've spoken to brothers and sisters in the north of England and the only reason it's happening more in the north of England because there is a more of uh, a presence of people from the Asian background living in the north of England. That's the only reason. Where brothers are running away from home, sisters are running away from home just so they are saved from this. Because they are being forced to get married to someone they don't even know. Wallah, inshallah change will come about. Inshallah, change will come about. It's a slow process and it, it has a lot of negativity attached to it. You know, we are going to get blamed and we are going to get tarnished and our reputation is going to get tarnished. All sorts of things are going to happen. But I sincerely believe that if goodness comes out of it for the Ummah of the Muslims in Britain, Inshallah, I'm willing to go for it. Wallah, I'll do it. Not only myself, the other Imams who are with me, we are going to go for it. We are going to start having seminars around the UK regarding this matter because it's difficult. It is seriously hard to read an email, receive a phone call, a message on Facebook. We day in, day out, day in, day out, where brothers and sisters are complaining. They are calling out for help. 
just to make you aware that inshallah change will come about and we leave it to Allah to grant us success. And we need to leave it to Allah to grant us success in this matter and enable us to propagate the correct understanding of the deen in this matter. But this should not be, this should not be a reason for you to get involved in a haram relationship. Think of the group of young men who walked past the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were talking about marriage. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what? Ya Shabab, oh young men, you are at that age. Go and get married and save yourself. Get married and save yourself. You know when physically your body tells you you are ready to get married, mentally you are capable of it, the signs Allah makes apparent in you, then that is the time when you are supposed to get married. If you feel that you want to hold on for another three, four years, then that's your choice. That's your choice. The Sharia does not say that you have to get married the moment you turn 18 or the moment you turn 21. You want to wait till you're 25? Wait till you're 25. I did. You understand? I waited till I was 25. I can't be dealing with it before that. You understand? Uh, seriously, mm -mm. too much. But Alhamdulillah, for me personally, that was the best decision I made. Getting married at 25 and where I am now, Allah ni'ma, wallah, Allah ni'ma. Blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never been happier in my life. Apart from the time I went out in towers, but that was sick. <laughs> you understand? That was sick. My point being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you clear signs when you are ready to get married. To follow those signs, to go by that, and every step of the way seek advice in the matter. One thing that brothers and sisters ask you, and the answer is very obvious, is, look, I want to get, I've been asked, or there's a proposal that has come through, that so-and-so, uh, is to get married to me or I'm to, to get married to so-and-so and we've been asked to make a decision and I don't mind but I don't know what decision to make. What do you do? What do you do? Brother, what would you do if you had to make a decision? Say it, bro. Say it. <laughs> no. no, no. Istikhara. Yes? Istikhara. Follow the prophetic tradition. Guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do istikhara, do plenty of istikhara, okay? Also remember the narrations which can be found in the collection of Imam al-Muslim and al-Bukhari, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that as a man, when you look for a wife, then if you go for just beauty over her deen, then you have destroyed yourself. Go for the deen, let that be foremost over beauty. As a woman, clear instructions. If you go for his looks over his understanding of the deen, then you have destroyed yourself. Go for his understanding of the deen. Then it was asked, what is a man's understanding of the deen? It was said, his character. His character. Choose a husband with a good character. How do you find these things out before marriage if they are restrictions? How, as a man, do you find out if you're attracted to a woman to get married to? Sharia has given us the... We are allowed as men, for when there is the intention of nikah, then you are allowed to look at her face in the correct environment and understanding, not meeting up in Starbucks with your mates <laughs> and checking out yell. Don't do that. That's rather, that's dirty. <laughs> There's a word for people like that. You understand? We're Muslims. Be loftier than that. Have a better understanding than that. Haya, shame. You understand? Haya, sign of a believer. Kuntum khayru ummatil ukhrizat nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you from the best of mankind. This community is the best of communities. Why? You are from the community of Abdul Khalq salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi wa ala alayhi. You are his followers. He's your Nabi, he's your Rasul. Look at the companions, these are the people we follow. If we claim to follow them, let it not be a claim, let it be a reality. Nobody is saying, abandon your Western ways. But do not lose your good character, do not lose your adab, do not lose adab. Adinu kulluhu adabun. You understand? 
Nobody's saying stop dressing like you're living in the desert in Africa. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying stop wearing Western clothing. La. But make sure the clothing on the heart is that of the Sunnah. Make sure your inward character is in line with the prophetic character. Make sure you respect people's differences. But at the same time, do not lose your touch with the reality. Your reality is that you're a Muslim, you're a believer, wallah. You're a believer. We are supposed to be those people. But you know when it rains, there's dry, barren land. You know when it's dry, barren land? When it rains on dry, barren land, if, I'm sure they must, you must have seen this back home in, in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or wherever. In Africa, we have dry, barren land. You understand? Dry land. And when it rains, then that rain, it nourishes the land. And the land comes, the cracks disappear and the land comes together. Then within three or four weeks, the shoots of vegetation coming from that ground. Because rain has come down on it. Believers are supposed to be those people. Wherever you go, there's dry, barren people around you. But because of you, they get cultivated. Because of your presence there, it makes a change in their life. You as a Muslim, you're supposed to be that individual. For in the Quran, Al Karim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, With call a rubbukal in Malaikat, inni jailum fil abdi khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, inni jailum fil abdi khalifa. I have sent my representatives. You represent the deen of Allah. You represent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's supposed to be the be all and end all for you. He is supposed to be everything you think about day and night. How do you please Allah through him, salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi, through his teachings, through his understandings? So when you go into a group of people, you should be the nourishment that comes about. For the Messenger of Allah, salawat rabbi wa salam alayhi, has said, the difference between a believer and a non-believer is what? Al-falq al-bayn al hayy wal mayyit. The difference between a person who is alive and a person who is dead. You're the one who is alive. You're the one who is alive, bring life to the dead. I'm not saying go around giving mouth to mouth for everyone. <laughs> but just the way you are as an individual, as a person, keeping these things in mind and then going towards marriage, this will be the best decision for you, inshallah. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants good for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us, Wallah. If we seriously start to think about Allah's mercy, if we only think about His mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll stop counting, but His mercy will not end. His mercy will not end. The fact that we're sitting here now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained good for us, for believers only get together in His remembrance, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah intends good for them. And remember that gathering no longer remains the gathering in the realms of this world. According to the prophetic tradition, that gathering is elevated to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where even angels supplicate for the people in that gathering. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us today in a gathering that is in his remembrance subhanahu wa ta'ala. To better ourselves as Muslims, as human beings. And let us be true representatives of the deen. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is as such. Wallah. Even if you feel that your sins have exceeded limitations, for a moment, for a moment, think, if it wasn't for Allah's mercy, you would not even be able to comprehend that thought itself. Call out to Allah's mercy. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not ever lose hope in Allah's mercy. Never lose hope in Allah's mercy. For even there can be a second in the life of a parent where you get annoyed with your children and you don't want to have nothing to do with them. Just for a second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even leave us for that second. Allah's mercy does not even leave us for that second. Wallah, call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll realize that Allah is so merciful upon you. One of the best things that you have to call out upon to Allah is a good marriage. For brothers, supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah grants you a wife 
who is good for your dunya and your hereafter, who is able to fulfill rights towards you and you fulfill rights towards her, who is able to become a good mother to your children and is able to be your partner, who is there for you when nobody is there for you, who is your best friend, who you can relate to, who you can speak to. Sisters, you supplicate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a husband who is perfect in character. And even if he has imperfections, you love him still because of the goodness that he has within him. And he fulfills his rights towards you. And he really is the crown of your head. For remember, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once approached by the companions. And they said to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should it not be that we prostrate in front of you, for you are the messenger of Allah. And what did he say? La, no. Prostration is only for Allah. It's only for Allah. But if it was allowed, then a wife would prostrate towards her husband. If it was allowed, and remember the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, on the day of Qiyamah, the foremost amongst the men will be those who treated their wives with good character. Who treated their wives with good character. نَسَلُكَ اللَّهُمَ يَبَاسِتَ الْيَدَيْنِ بِالْعَطِيَّةِ وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا يَا ذُو الْعُلَى فِي هَذِهِ السَّاعَةِ I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives us without us even asking him that he forgives us in this hour and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me and you to fulfill our rights towards one another Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a gathering of khair, of goodness and afiyah of protection, of luqf, of tranquility Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a true understanding of the deen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us true love for his beloved Salawat Rabbi wa salam Increase us in that love, expand that love within us so every action of our life is in line with the prophetic sunnah. Salawat Rabbi wa salam alayhi wa la hadrat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al Fatiha. Subhana Rabbi ka Rabbi al Izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al Mursaleen wa alhamdulillah Rabbi al Alameen. I call you Kauli Hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisaa ibn al Mu'mineen. Inna huwa al Ghafoor al Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.